this morning we're beginning a new series called Live Generously. And so for the next three weeks as we uh, march towards the end of this month, we're going to be studying what it means to live a lifestyle of generosity. Um, this is an idea of um, saying, kind of prefacing that living generously has a, a lot more to do with life than just your pocketbook. See, living a generous life means that you have or you are wrestling with deep issues and how those issues affect your biblical worldview as well as your checking account. Issues like starvation and poverty. Deep issues that we should wrestle with. Winston Churchill is quoted as saying, We make a living by what we get. But we make a life by what we give. You see, our struggle sometimes is not that we lack the desire to provide assistance. But rather we have accumulated enough excuses to distract us from assisting. And so this morning in the first message of this series, I've titled it, No Excuses. Idleness and Indulgence are bred in the great dead sea of life. And in that stagnant sludge of idleness and indulgence, even the most beneficial blessings will produce no good. You see, the sluggard or a lazy person rarely recognizes himself even when boldly confronted with the reality of his problem. When the slacker is confronted with his laziness, with the facts that show he is accomplishing very little with his own life, he always has an excuse, doesn't he? Even a ridiculous excuse is credible or seems credible when someone has an arsenal of excuses. A husband and wife woke up one Sunday morning and the wife got dressed for church. It was just about time to leave for the service when she noticed that her husband hadn't moved a finger towards getting dressed. Perplexed, she asked him, why aren't you dressed for church? And he replied, because I don't want to go. And she said, well, do you have any good excuse? He said, yes, I have three good excuses. First, the congregation is cold. Second, no one likes me. And third, I don't want to go. Well, the wife replied by saying, Honey, I have three good reasons why you should go. First, the congregation is warm. Second, there are a few people who do like you. And third, you're the pastor, so get dressed. <laughs> yes. Excuses. We all have them, don't we? Our passage this morning is in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 15. Turn with me, if you will. If you're not familiar with that, where that's at, it's the fifth book in the, the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You get to Deuteronomy, turn to chapter 15, and we're going to begin in a moment in verse 7. But it's important that we kind of set the stage and understand where we are in this passage. You see, some theologians differ, but others will agree that this Old Testament book of Deuteronomy is a collection of the last sermons of Moses. After 40 years of wandering in the desert, as we have come to know the story, the unbelieving and disobedient Israelites had to die off. It's really a story about dying in the desert more than it is wandering. It's the nation, after they have died off, would soon enter the promised land. And so Moses comes to a place now where he reminds them of the commandments and encourages them to faithfully obey God. And if they will obey, then God will provide for them and allow them to stay in the promised land that he has given to them all of their, li all of their lives. If they disobey him, then God will judge them and drive them out of the promised land. And one of those commandments was to be generous so as to provide for the needs of the poor. 
God promises, if they would be generous to meet the needs of others, they would never have anyone poor in their land. Think about that. You see, chapter 15 of Deuteronomy is about generosity. And generosity is illustrated here for us in the law of the release of debts. Look at verse 1 of chapter 15. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a remission of debts. Now, it's important to understand this sabbatical year, so if you want to, Hold your finger there for a moment and turn back to the book of Leviticus, chapter 25. And this is important to understand as we set the stage of generosity to know that there's more to the tithe than what we think sometimes. You see, the law of the tithe had several things that were tied to it. And one of those was the land of Sabbath rest. Every seven years... The Israelites were commanded to let the land rest. Leviticus chapter 25, read verse 4. Or let's go to uh, 3, going into verse 4. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its crops. Verse 4. But during the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field, nor prune your vineyard, and your harvest aftergrowth you shall not reap, and your grapes of untrimmed vines you shall not gather. The land shall have a sabbatical year. So I want you to process this for a minute. It's important to bring that passage into play early. Because every seventh year now we are told it is the grant of remission of debts. It's also that seventh year where the land rests. So understand this for a minute. On that seventh year, they were not to sow the land. And as a farmer, that is income. So they were to sacrifice on that seventh year a year's worth of income. Add that to your 10%. And then, now they are told on that seventh year to grant the remission of debts. And we're going to look at that further in just a moment. Now in Deuteronomy chapter 15, look at verse 12. Because we're talking about generosity here. So we don't sow, we don't make money that seventh year. We also grant the release of debts to those that owe them to us. And then verse 12. If your kinsman, a Hebrew man or woman, is sold to you, Then he shall serve you six years, but in the seventh year you shall set him free. When you set him free, you shall not send him away empty-handed. Watch what you give him. You shall furnish him liberally from your flock and from your threshing floor and from your wine vat. You shall give to him as the Lord your God has blessed you. Wow. And so the generosity of the release of debts now goes to the law of the release of slaves. Seventh year was a big year, wasn't it? When an Israelite owed another, they were to be forgiven of their debts on that seventh year and forgiven in full. Now, what is generosity? It's more than an action. It really is an attitude. And here's the best definition I can give you this morning. Generosity is the most natural outward expression of an inner attitude of compassion. Generosity is the most natural outward expression of an inner attitude of compassion. It's a mindset in which is open and you become open to share and care for others. It is a lifestyle in which giving is without calculation or grudge. And Moses tells the Israelites to not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted. 
to not be stingy, but rather open-hearted because giving willingly leads to living generously. Pick up in verse 7 of Deuteronomy 15 and let's read together. Moses says, If there is a poor man with you, one of your brothers, in any of your towns in your land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart, nor close your hand from your poor brother, but you shall freely open your hand to him, and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need in whatever he lacks. Beware that there is no base thought in your heart saying, The seventh year, the year of remission, is near, and your eye is hostile toward your poor brother, and you give him nothing. Then he may cry to the Lord against you, and it will be a sin in you. Verse 10, You shall generously give to him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him. Because for this thing, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all your undertakings. For the poor will never cease to be in the land. Therefore I command you, saying, You shall freely open your hand to your brother, to your needy, and to the poor in your land. The first thought this morning, and we've provided a place in the back of your worship guide to take some notes, and there's also a place where you can fill in the blank this morning, and the first thought is this. There is no excuse for withholding compassion. Moses tells the people that a generous spirit with their fellow Israelites will result in no poverty in the land. That still amazes me to think about. There are astronomical amounts of people just in the state of Texas nationwide and throughout this country worldwide of poverty and starvation. So could it really be possible that there was no poor in the land? Well, listen to what happened when the church caught on to this idea and became full of the Spirit. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were one of heart and soul. And no one said that any of his possessions was his own. But instead they held everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And grace was on all of them. Watch verse 34, Acts chapter 4. For there was not a needy person among them. Because all those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet. This was then distributed to each person as anyone had a need. They understood. They were not owners, but they were stewards. They were managers of the things that had been given to them. Ultimately, it was God's land. It was God's house and if he wanted it sold to meet the needs of others then so be it and they simply managed God's possessions that he loaned them and generosity then resulted that there was no poor in the church in verse 4 of Deuteronomy chapter 15 we find where Moses says however there will be no poor among you since the Lord will surely bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess. You see, they recognize and Moses reminds them, God is giving this to you. It's really not yours to begin with. And God promised if they would be generous, there'd be no poor. Could that happen in America today? Yes. I'm an eternal optimist, but I, I just think it could. My God is still in the business of performing miracles, and I think that could be a miracle we could pray for. You see, God knew there would be greed and selfishness. He knew there would be reluctance to supply for the needs of a poor person. And so He gives them instructions. Do not be 
stingy. Do not be tight-fisted. Look at verse 7. If there's a poor man with you, one of your brothers, in any of your towns, in your land, which the Lord your God is giving you, do not harden your heart, nor close your hand from your brother. David Platt, who is the executive director of the International Mission Board, made a very strong statement. Listen to these words. He says, if our lives do not reflect radical compassion for the poor, there is reason to wonder if Christ is really in us at all. Wow. Platt is saying, if you're not generous, then there is question of whether you are a true follower of Christ or not. If you're not generous, Platt would say there is legitimate question to say, have you come to a true point of salvation in your life? Because he says there's reason to wonder if Christ is really in us at all. Strong words to remind us of the calling to live generously and there's no excuse for withholding compassion to someone but see we live in a day and age where a typical response to the poor is to refuse to meet their needs maybe we think they don't deserve it you worked for yours let them work for theirs Moses reminds the Israelites just who it was who gave them what they have. And I think a good reminder for us today. Who has given us all that we have? God. It really isn't ours to begin with. Your health to work your strength of mind to volunteer or your strength of back to serve, the opportunity to earn your own wage ultimately comes from God. There's a great ministry in our community that was launched by this wonderful church known as Lubbock Impact. And the opportunity that some of you have had to go and to serve on Wednesdays as I have and our deacons and other summit groups. It'll change the way you view this community when you rub elbows with Lubbock's working poor. And they come to get a meal. They come to get dental care or a prescription filled or the clothes closet, the food closet, the shoe closet. It's an opportunity to really understand what generosity looks like. Because as my friend Jeff Jones, who owns Jones and Associates here in town, and is a member of this church, as he says, we are all one paycheck away from needing Lubbock Impact. Friends, there's no excuse for withholding compassion. There's no excuse... Or blame or to say, well, they just got to work for theirs. I worked for mine. You see, the law of, of the release of debts means that no matter what that person owed you, in that seventh year, you canceled it out. You canceled it out. I don't want that back. It's a gift. That's hard in the world and the society in which we're living in today. We want our money back. We want the investment and the return on what we've given to you. The second thought is that there's no excuse for withholding grace. Moses said, do not be hard-hearted towards the poor or tight-fisted in your responses, clinging to your possessions. Why? Because generosity is a response to the gift of God's grace. 
Israel saw God's grace in the gift of the land that He would give them when they crossed over Jordan into the promised land. We see God's generosity in the gift of His Son who died on the cross for us. Look at verse 9. At verse nine. Beware that there is no base for thought in your heart saying, The seventh year, the year of remission is near. And your eye is hostile toward your poor brother. And you give him nothing. And then he may cry to the Lord against you. And it will be a sin in you. An Israelite in a desperate condition. Goes to a fellow brother and seeks help. Knowing that the next year is the year of release. The year of remission of debts. The year of the Sabbath. And so there's no way this man can repay all that he borrows before the year of release is fulfilled. So the law will require that what is not paid back be forgiven. And the tendency is what Moses is saying. The tendency will be not to loan all of what is needed because the seventh year is near. Think of it like this. We'll put it in some financial terms. Say someone were to need $5,000 and you have that and that person comes to you in that need but you know in the back of your mind next year is the year of the release of debts and I know I'm probably not going to get all this back so I'm only going to give him $2,500. Moses says, that's a sin. Because you didn't meet the need, you protected yourself. You didn't give graciously. You gave with condition. It wasn't generosity. You were just trying to protect the bottom line. And Moses says that that's a tendency to to drift towards that knowing that That next year, there's no way he's going to be able to pay me that $5,000 back. So I'm not going to give it all to him. Because then I have to forgive what he doesn't return. Moses calls this wicked self-interests. It sounds smart, doesn't it? It Sounds savvy. But see, we are not called... To emulate this method of financial practice. This was to be a witness to the nation of Israel. Of God's generosity. And how that spills over into those that are managing the land that he has given to them. Remember they are stewards. And so we're not called to reproduce this practice. But we are called to demonstrate this principle in life. A.W. Tozer made the statement that said, As mercy is God's goodness, confronting human misery and guilt, so grace is God's goodness directed toward human debt and demerit. There's no excuse for withholding compassion when there is potential that there would be no poor in the land. We could eradicate poverty with compassion. And there's no excuse for withholding grace. Because grace has been given to all of us. And grace is the goodness that God directs towards our human debts. You know the old song? He paid a debt I could not pay. Final thought this morning is that there's no excuse for failing to give. Verse 10, give to him and do not withhold. You shall generously give and your heart shall not be grieved when you give. Because for this thing the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and your undertakings. And for the poor will never cease to be in the land. 
You see, he wants them to be generous in spirit rather than stingy and unwilling. Do not be generous or do not give only out of duty all the while wishing you didn't have to do it. See, this is not worthy of a heart which has received the grace of God and poured out in them. Have you seen the television show Hoarders? It's that show that something has gone terribly wrong with a person's thinking. And everyone but the hoarder recognizes that clinging to their treasures is ruining their life. And how much happier and healthier they would be if they would give their things away. Look at the blessings they're missing to enrich many if only they had a heart to give rather than a heart to hold on to. And that show hits home when we think about ourselves being hoarders of the things that God has generously given to us. And we refuse to give back. The importance of giving is not only seen in the emphatic language that Moses uses, but it's also a very strong imperative. God commanded them to be generous. Moses says in verse 11, For there will never cease to be poor. That is why I'm commanding you. You must willingly open your hands. Again in verse 15, he would say, Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I am giving you this command today. Strong language. Generosity is not a matter of charity. Generosity, my friends, is a matter of obedience. And the stingy Christian is not simply being selfish. The stingy Christian is rejecting God. In verse 7, he says hard-hearted. Verse 8, he says wicked. Verse 10, he says stingy. And in the Bible, the heart represents our mindset, our will, our purposes, and even our own determination. And a heart that is stingy squelches the compassion of from meeting the needs of others. A heart that is stingy fails to be reminded of the grace that has been bestowed upon that person. And if we are going to be generous, then we need a heart not of self-interest, but of the interests of others. Generosity is understanding your blessings from God are to be blessings to others. God wants us to give willingly. It's important to Him. It's personal and therefore must become important to us that we follow His example. It would be unimaginable to know all the good which will occur when God's people give willingly and live generously. Without excuse. And Henry Nouwen said, When we give generously with an abundance mentality, what we give away will multiply. Friends, it's a journey. It's a process. But it is a command and a calling that we live generous lives. Let's pray together. Father, hard words this morning. As Moses reminded the nation of Israel. To not withhold compassion to his brother. In that year of the release of debts. He reminds his people. And we're reminded in the book of Acts. To not withhold grace because you've given so much to us. It's because of grace. Grace. That we've been set free. It's because of grace that we will one day stand in your presence. And God, there's no excuse 
for failing not to give. Moses calls that stinginess, tight-fisted, hard-hearted. And David Platts reminded us this morning, a lack of radical giving and compassion gives reason to question whether someone truly loves Jesus Christ and follows Him with radical obedience or not. And so God, would you remind us that generosity goes beyond the check that we write, the money that we give through online giving, but it goes in the attitude that we have towards Lubbock's working poor, those who have little and need so much. So God, we thank you. Thank you for what you've given to us. Thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to be generous. So God, remind us this week. Provide us an open door this week to live generously and to give without grudge and without calculation and know that it will be multiplied and returned to us we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand? A time of response. This is your moment, your invitation. You come as we sing together.